All right, we just went through an example here in class. Um, two and a half inch gate valve. This isn't in your book. I just brought this in. So two and a half inch gate valve, uh, 30 psi. I just wanted to find the pressure on it or the force on that cap. So two and a half inch gate valve. That's a round thing. So normally you call out round things by their diameters. That's normally how that's done. So that's a diameter. Half of that would be an inch and a quarter. 1.25 inches. Find the area of pi times the 1.25 squared. It's 4.91 inches squared. Take F equals PA, 30 pounds per square inch. The per square inch means that it goes on the bottom of the fraction here. So multiply that by 4.91 square inches, so the square inches cancel. And you get 147 pounds. <laughs> All right. So, so there's an example. Um, okay. That's called a blind flange sometimes. I don't know. It's a cap too. You know, sometimes uh, when you're building stuff underground, you might uh, have a flange type, like a all flange gate valve, like a uh, so flange by flange. And then on the back side, you might just flange in a plate if it's a dead end. It would be a similar situation. It's blind because it just dead ends. That's the meaning of that. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. All right, we went through this one. And then we're going to look at this uh, dam here. So I can't remember how far we got into this one. Um, what we've got is a dam stands like that. And it's 20 feet long. Now the one thing on this is when I'm doing something like this, I, I know that my pressure is going to be in PSI. Even though I measure the height in feet, the pressure is in PSI because the conversion goes from feet to PSI. So when I see that, I know I'm going to want to get uh, areas in square inches. Okay. Now, so 20 feet, I think we already came up with that. It's 120. No, it's not. It's 240 inches. Okay. And then what we want here, what's causing the force is the water. So the actual height of the dam isn't important. What's important is the height of the water. Okay. So the water is 8 feet high. So that's 96 inches high. Okay, so we got 8 feet, 12 inches per foot, 96 inches, and then we've got 20 feet, 12 inches per foot. So that's 240 inches. Okay. Now, what I want out of this is the uh, the area of the dam. Okay. So what I'm going to do there is take that area and take 240 inches and take 96 inches and multiply them together. See, that will get me the area of the dam. And it's in the unit that I want, which is square inches. So 240 times 96, 2340. So 23,040 square inches. All right, with that. So that's the area of the dam that the water pushes on. Okay. So it's this hatched area here. Okay, right there. And that's what we want. Now what we want is the pressure on the area. Now what the deal is with this is that pressure varies. It just depends where you are in the dam because the pressure depends on the depth of the water. So up at the top, the pressure is zero. Down at the bottom, so P zero is just zero. But the pressure down at eight feet, that's going to be eight feet times the conversion there, 0.433 PSI per foot. Okay, and that will get you the pressure at the bottom. The deal is, is that the pressure varies. The deeper you go, the more the pressure. Okay. So 
So that's 3.464. So 3.464 um, pounds per square inch, okay? So that's down here. So what I would like here would be the pressure, the average pressure, okay? So the average pressure would be the average of the two. That's just a nice, easy rectangle to work with. There's no, you know, nothing fancy we need to do mathematically. If we just find the average pressure, um, that will get us what we will use to uh, work to find this force. So it's 0 plus 3.464 over 2, and that's 1.732 pounds per inch squared. Okay, now that's the average pressure. And we have to use that because um, you, um, you've got varying pressure. The deeper you go, the more the pressure is, okay? Now, what we're doing here works fine with symmetrical kind of surfaces, circles, and rectangles. If you got some weird shape, you, you know, um, you know, uh, if you have a, a window, let's say, underwater, and it's shaped like that, you can't do this. You have to break out your calculus book and do it that way because this will vary. The, the averages get too tricky. Okay, so th this approach will work pretty much with rectangles and circles. The shapes are rectangles and circles. That's what this approach will work with. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. What it sounds like? Did you say oh. it doesn't work for a trapezoid? Yeah, it won't. Because you've got two, the areas aren't balanced. So you just can't use the average pressure. The average pressure assumes that you've got kind of a balance of area above and below it. If, if your shape is unbalanced like that, not symmetrical, you can't, this little p average thing won't work. It, that turns into a calculus problem, which we'll, we won't get into that, of course, but but just so you know. Circles, you mentioned? Yeah, well. Circles will work fine, yeah. Anything kind of symmetrical. So a rectangle, um, see, why don't I back up just a second. The, the, an easier way to get the average pressure is not to go through this. An easier way to get the average pressure is to find the average depth, okay? So the average depth is four feet on this, right? and then find the pressure at four feet, and that will be the average pressure. That, that's really the simplest way to get the average pressure, rather than finding the pressure at the top and the pressure in the bottom. It's the quicker way to do it is this way, okay? And what you're kind of assuming, darn this thing, I'm sorry, I just, this thing is a little difficult to write on, there we go, is 1.732 pounds per inch squared, okay? That's really the, the easiest way to get it, okay? Just find, find the average depth and find the pressure at the average depth. Now, the, the deal with that is, like on a rectangle, here's the average depth. You got half the area above, half below. It's symmetrical. You can, you can just use that. Same thing with a circle. If you take the average depth here, half the area above, half below, you know, that works fine. But it gets a little trickier when you start going like a trapezoid or something because the area on the top doesn't equal the area on the bottom and they're distributed kind of funny. They're not symmetrical, so it doesn't work anymore. It would be a circle, we would still do the area of the circle like five squared. Yeah, right, yeah. They don't build tanks in trapezoids. Yeah, I know, yeah, it's actually, it's not usually a difficult problem because, yeah, you're not going to see too many trapezoidal tanks out there, I don't think. Damn. Or, well, even that, it's, it's a cross-sectional area. I mean, we're doing a rectangle, you know, in the face we're looking at, it's a rectangular dam, you know, so. So for most everyday things, this is fine. Okay, it works good. No worries. Okay. So we so we good. We got the pressure, 1.732 pounds per square inch. And just to be, you know, we did it two different ways. Okay, we did it that way. We did it this way. This second way is probably the simplest way generally to use. Okay. And then once you've got the uh, that 
pressure, the 1.732, and you've got the area, you can find the force. It's uh, 23,040 inches squared multiplied by the 1.732 pounds per inch squared. Multiply those out, and you're probably going to get uh, a lot of pounds pushing on this thing, okay? So 39,905 is what I got. So that's how much force is pushing the dam down the river. This one. Okay. And that is something to realize, you know, when you, you were working on a dam, is, you know, there's a lot of force building up behind those things. As you build the water higher and higher, that, that pressure and as a result the force go up and up. So, you know, you want to be aware of that. So, we're good with that. Any questions? All right, now when they, when they design a dam, they anchor them, you know. They've got all sorts of stuff going on with these things, but they take the head wall and they extend it into the bank. Usually they've got a wing wall on the back side that, again, is extended into the bank, and they've got a toe wall that goes down into the soil underneath. Okay, so they've got all these walls going on here, and one of their purposes is to anchor the dam so the water just doesn't take it and push it down the, down the river, you know. Now, they serve other purposes, too, because when you build that water up and you, you get water pressure, that water's going to try and sneak around, you know. So it's going to try and come around this way. It's going to get pushed under the dam. It's going to get pushed around that way. So those walls prevent that. Because if you don't prevent it, the water can start piping through and you can start having problems. I remember I, I designed one of these little things and there were cobbles on the floor of the creek there, the river. I got a little nervous about that because, you know, the water is just going to seep through that like nothing, you know. So that this tow wall, I had to design that thing really deep, and that wasn't going to be any picnic digging through those cobbles and trying to get that thing free a meter or two down into the bed there, that's for sure. So okay. so, so that's just a little bit there on the designs and, and how, well, how this pressure affects the dam. That uh, Rock Creek Dam, you know, what they'll do, did, did you all go out to Rock Creek, you water folks? Did you have a look at that dam? Mm -hmm. did, did you see on the back side there was a perf pipe coming out of there? Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's, they, what they do, they run a perforated pipe down the length of the dam. They're trying to collect any seepage in there. Then it'll start dripping out of a pipe that goes out on the back side. So when you're expecting that thing, you look at that pipe coming out the back side, and you, do, you don't want to see water coming out of that. That's bad news if you see water coming out of it, okay? So, okay, so that's kind of that water pressure pushing it in. You know, that dam is kind of a, like, oh, this darn thing. <laughs> Let's see, I'm going to escape out of there for just a second, and then go into edit. Can I, can I make a new page, you think? Yeah, I think I can. Okay, here we go. All right, so that dam there, you know, that's an earthen dam with a little bit of a spillway around the side of it, you know, to get the water around it. So that thing looks like that, essentially, kind of a big old trapezoidal kind of berm looking thing. It's very simplified, but that's the idea. Actually, that back side of that dam is quite deep, I know that, but, but that's the idea. So what they'll do here, they'll take a perforated pipe and run it the length, I think is how this works. And that's perforated, you know, meaning it's got holes in it. So if there's water seeping through that dam, they want some of it to get into this perforated pipe, and then they have another pipe sticking out the back side like there. So if you see water dripping out of that, that's not good because water's getting through your dam now. And that's, that, that ain't going to last forever, okay? That means the water's piping through, and it's going to cause some real problems with your dam. So it's built just to make, just to tell if your dam's leaking out. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just a way of a monitoring device, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, I guess one part of this stuff is running the numbers and all that, but the other part is kind of understanding what's going on. I mean, you, you back water up, that pressure is built up, and there's a lot of area, and it just starts pushing hard, and it starts trying to 
push water through the dam too is what it tries to do okay all right. All right, let's have another look at another example. Let's say we got a square window, okay? So, let's see. Now notice it's a 24 inch by 24 inch window. What, what pressure would you use on that thing? If you're gonna find the force on that window, how would you find, what's the quick, easy way to find the pressure? Uh, wouldn't you use like 10 feet down? 10 will get you to the top, 12 will get you to the bottom. So what's the deal on this? What, what, what do, I just you know? got a question, what am I looking at? <laughs> yeah, I have the best sketch in the world, is it? Um, that's a, what you're looking at uh, um, is, that means water surface, an up, inverted triangle. So this is the okay, surface of the water. A, what is this screen? I'm not gonna... It's, it's a, a window, and let's say you've got a, oh, I don't know. Um, you ever seen like like I remember going to a I've been to a dam somewhere where they got a window down at, below it and you can watch the trout in there kind of swimming around. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Okay, kind of like like trout like an aquarium or something. Yeah, aquarium or maybe I don't know a submarine. I don't know. You know who knows? Um, but maybe a, a best example like well for us would be like a dam with with a concrete dam with a walkway behind this window and you can see what's happening at okay. the bottom of the dam. That's, that's kind of, and I, I, I don't think the best sketch in the world. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll make that out of silver and we'll put some, a couple of worms on that hook, see what we can do. I don't know what that is exactly, but, um, okay, so that's just a window, yeah, okay. And the, uh, so let's see how much, so on the back side of it, it's dry, that's the idea, okay. Sure. Okay, so let's find the force on the window. So what, what's what's the cleanest way to get that force on the window? Eleven feet. Yeah, right. Go eleven because now it's twenty-four inches there. Now that's two feet. So what the deal is to the top, it's a ten-foot depth. To the bottom, it's a twelve-foot depth. Okay. So if you want the average pressure, take the average depth. That's the depth of the middle of the window. That's what I was just kind of talking about there a minute ago. So that's eleven feet to the middle. So the quickest way to get the average pressure is use the 11 foot depth, calculate the pressure at 11 feet deep. That will get you the average pressure. So find the pressure 11 feet down, and then take that by the area of the window. That's, that's basically how you do this. Is there any reason why you would want to use the other formula? This is quicker. You could use the other. You're going to get the same. Yeah, you get the same answer. Doesn't matter really. I mean, you can do either way. Uh, this is quicker. That's all. I don't know what decimal um, point. You're trying to find the average of something, especially like PSI, you probably won't even need the decimal points, right? Yeah, it depends on how fine a measurement you're taking. I, I, I like to go in three places, you know, this can't hurt. Right. And uh, sometimes I overkill it, but it's better to overkill it than to round it too much. Sure. I, I think. I can always round it back when I'm done, if, if I think I've got too many figures in there, you know. Right. The area then, okay. Now the thing on this is keep an eye, uh, that PSI, you know, you, people just see that, they don't think about it so much. What that means is pounds per square inch. 
pounds in the top, square inches on the bottom. So what that means, if you want to get a force using the PSI, you get that area that you use to get a force has to be in square inches. The units have to match to get meaningful answers. Okay, so for that area, you want 24 inches by 24 inches. Not two feet by two feet, but you want this in square inches. And that's 576, I think. Okay. And then you just find the force by taking the pressure times the area. a pretty big number there, you know, between two and three thousand pounds is pushing on that little two foot by two foot window. And if you ever, uh, if you go out to the Oregon Coast Aquarium, look at some of their stuff where you're looking underwater, they got thick windows in there, you know, they don't mess around with that stuff. They're, they're strong, you know, they don't, because uh, the pressures usually aren't that big, but the areas add up when you start using square inches. So you can end up getting a lot of force, okay. Right, and you got lots of square inches. That's the idea. Yeah. <clears throat> so I got twenty-seven forty-two pounds. All right. So that's the basics of it, right there. Just uh, pressure times area, and usually it's the area. You know, normally, and especially in our line of work, we're not dealing with huge pressures, but the areas can be significant. You know. And that can create an awful lot of force. All right. Now let's look at a couple other uh, kind of special cases, you might call them. First one's a hydraulic jack. So this is on uh, page 82, I think. So let's see how to go through a calculation like this. Um, these are used. Uh, you know, most jacks nowadays for cars are scissor jacks, but I've, I've had a hydraulic jack that we used to jack up a car. Um, and what you've got on a hydraulic jack is you've got hydraulic fluid, which is a special fluid that's designed not to compress. It doesn't compress at all. Okay. And then you've got pistons on these things on either side. And normally what you've got where you apply a force is a small piston. And then when you want to lift something on that side, you got a bigger piston. That's generally how these things work. All right. Now, if you're going to, uh, to do this, what you're going to do is transmit force from one side, in this case, this 100-pound side, to the other. So we're going to see what happens to this 100 pounds if we apply the 100 pounds to a 1-inch radius piston and have it um, pushing on a 3-inch radius piston. Okay, so that's the idea of what we want to do here. <coughs> now, with this particular problem here, we're not concerned about elevation change at all. That's not what's going to cause our pressure. What causes the pressure here is pushing with 100 pounds. Okay, that, that's really what causes the pressure. So this isn't about finding how far down it is here and finding the pressure there. That's not the deal. That's, that's pretty insignificant compared to pushing with 100 pounds on that piston. So what we want to do here first is find the areas of those pistons. And I, I, you're, given them in, you're given the radii. So let's find the areas here. Okay.
So if you got a deal like this, you know, I'd find the areas first. Okay, so 3.14 and 28.27, actually 28.3 square inches. Now what we want to do is find the pressure that's in that hydraulic fluid. Okay, and we're pushing on it with 100 pounds. And uh, it's over a 3.14 square inch area. So if we take 100 pounds and divide it by the area, 3.14, we'll get the pressure in the fluid, 31.8. And that's pounds per square inch. Okay. <clears throat> so what the deal is here is there's 31.8 pounds per square inch anywhere in that fluid, OK? We're not looking at elevation change here or anything like that. We're just anywhere in that fluid, it's pretty it's going to be pretty darn close to 31.8 pounds per square inch. Again, think of that fluid as being like a bunch of marbles. If you push on one side, that force goes all the way through. Okay? So we got 31.8 pounds per square inch in that jack. <clears throat> And what we're doing there, we're just taking the force that we apply and we're dividing it by the area. That's how we came up with that, 31.8. Now, if we want to get the force out on the other side, what we do is take the pressure, which is 31.8 uh, pounds per square inch, and then multiply it by the area. 28.3 inches squared, okay? And that'll tell us what we're getting out the other side. And the assumption there is the pressure in that hydraulic fluid is the same everywhere. You know, that's, that's what we're working with here. And when you round that out, I'm getting about 900 pounds. Okay. Okay. So with a jack like this, you know, these speed, my brother had one, he had a little sports car, and um, he had a little jack, it was hydraulic, had a little handle on it. I remember jacking that car up. And essentially what I was doing is I was taking the strength of my arm and using it to lift the car. That's really what I was doing. Now I was using this mechanical device to make it happen, but I was using, you know, the muscles of my arm to lift up the car. Now obviously I can't lift up a car on my own, so I used this mechanical device to do it with. I was able to take whatever force I could apply on the jack handle and get that multiplied up on the, on the, to raise the car. Now what's the price that I paid for that? Energy expended. Yeah, energy, which transmits into what? If I'm working on that jack, what am I doing? Something like that. And how far is the car going up while well, I'm doing this? About that, yeah, okay. So, so that's the price you pay. You, you leverage your force up, but what you lose is distance. That's the idea, okay? So I exerted, you know, my, whatever, my, my 20 pounds, I exerted it over whatever, um, 1,000 inches. And I was able to turn that into 400 pounds over you know, just a couple inches was the idea. Okay? I don't know if those numbers worked out or not, but that's the idea. Okay? So you're using a certain amount of energy. You're just changing uh, the ratio between the force and the distance on the energy. Okay? So that's a little special case there, a hydraulic jack. Now there's actually a quicker way to do this if you want, now, but you have to kind of remember it. These usually don't find the formula for this anywhere. So what we're doing here is we're, if, if we got round pistons especially, this, this, comes, this will work. 
So I want to find the uh, pressure. I take 100 pounds times pi times uh, the uh, 1 inch squared. That gets me the pressure. And then I multiply that times pi times the back side of the piston squared. That's the area on the back side. So that's what I'm doing to get the force. That's how I get the 900. So if you pay a little bit of attention to that, algebraically, those pi's will cancel. So what I'm doing, I'm taking my force in times the ratio of the radius out squared divided by the radius in squared. And if I do that like so, I can get to that answer pretty quick, okay? So what I can do, I'm squaring both of those, so I can just put the square out here if I want. So what's going on there, I'm taking 100 pounds, I've got a ratio of the pistons of 3 to 1, and I just square that. Okay, and with that, that'll be 100 pounds times 9. Now the units on the pistons, they, you know, they'll cancel it out, they're both length, and that'll get me the 900 pounds. So there's a little bit quicker way to work through that if you want. Okay. What's the uh, number that you put on the, uh, you see uh, F1 and then you have R2 squared over R oh. inches? Yeah, no, I screwed that up. I, I, I kind of, when I change this one, instead out and in, that's probably how I should have done it. I, had R, I meant to do R2 and R1, but then I kind of changed the one into in. So it's probably easier if I say R out divided by R in, if you know what, you know, kind of what I mean by that. It would be R2 over R1. Now, you'll never, you won't find that formula sheet on any of those standard formula sheets that you get, probably, but it's, it's a shortcut you can use if you ever wanted to, if you remember it well enough. Okay. We're good with that? All right, let's, um, let's look at another application. This is buoyancy. Okay. All right, now what's going on? Um, you know, that ship's made out of uh, steel, and, but it's hollow, you know. So as it gets deeper and deeper into the water, it moves more and more water out of the way. That's called displacement. And what happens here is as you displace water, you get an upward force equal to the weight of the displaced water. And this is the buoyancy force. This is why the boat floats, because when it moves water out of the way, there's a force upward that's exerted that equals the weight of the water moved out of the way. I kind of think of it in my mind as the water's trying to move back into that space it's been pushed out of, and it moves back in with a force equal to its own weight. It's kind of the idea. Okay. And this is what's called Archimedes' principle. A fluid creates an upward force, which is called the buoyant force, on a submerged object that is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. Displaced just means moved out of the way. Eureka. Yeah, Eureka, that's it, right? <laughs> and, you know, if some ships, if they travel around the world, they have what are called plimsoll lines on them, because cold water is more dense than warm water. So that can lead to a bit of a problem. You know, if you got your ship here, and I'll kind of look at it from the front. See if I can draw a ship. Wish me luck. There we go. If you're in the cold water up in, let's say, England, and you load that ship up, it's going to, maybe there'll be a line where the water is, okay? Well, if you say, and that might be a safe loading for that ship, and then you send it down to the uh, Caribbean, well, the water's warmer in the Caribbean, and it's lighter, so you don't get as much buoyancy force. 
So what's going to happen to that ship in warmer waters is it's going to sink deeper, okay? 1800s, you know, uh, Britain was kind of the big leader in, uh, you know, ships and shipping and all that. Somebody figured that out, you know, in a systematic way. They started painting lines on the ships for safe loading for this particular location, you know, so that they could actually visually see what the ships look like. You know, that they would paint a line, okay, here's the safe loading we can use in, in Britain when we load it up in Britain, because when we go to the Caribbean, we know it's going to sink deeper. Yeah, and so, so they started getting a little bit more careful about that. They're called Plimsoll lines. Some fellow named Plimsoll figured that, that one out. Okay. So that's an application of this. All right, now with buoyancy force, if the buoyancy force is greater than the weight, if there's more force pushing up than, than the weight going down, it'll float. And if the buoyancy force is less than the weight, it'll sink. Okay, that's the basic idea. Let's see. And I actually saw an article in one of the, I think it was a wastewater journal, some about what would happen if you fell into an aeration basin because the air and the water in an aeration basin decreases the density and you can't float quite as well. And the guy is real, I don't know, it was kind of tongue in cheek, but it had this whole discussion of, of what would happen if that occurred, you know, and how you wouldn't, with less density in the water, you wouldn't have as much buoyancy on you and, and that sort of thing. So, so that, you know, that's kind of the idea behind this. Would take more force in the swimming motion. Something, yeah, they had, yeah, they had some analysis of the best way to swim out of an aeration basin or something. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe they should have a life preserver there. I don't know. Okay. So I don't think we'll have time to get into all these these weighty matters here. So why don't we? Uh, we'll kind of cut it here. We'll we'll do this one on uh, Wednesday, I think. Okay. So remember that that homework's due here today. Okay. You said homework's due Monday. No, it's due today. Yeah, the next homework probably will be due Monday. It'll be that next chapter. I can't remember if I sign all of them or not out of that chapter, though. It's in, if you want to get a little bit of a head start. The, the problems that will be there will be is listed below the line. We just haven't moved them up yet.